Judge Reinhardt's colleague, Judge Newman, uh, Judge Noonan has said that because the Supreme Court uh, hears only about 1% of the cases that are presented to it, uh, federal judges are about as likely to be reversed by the Supreme Court as they are to be struck by lightning. If that is so, then we are about to hear from our nation's best lightning rod. Uh, in the 1996 term alone, uh, Judge Reinhardt was reversed by the Supreme Court no fewer than seven times. Um, since then, things have gotten slightly better. Um, in the term that concluded last June, uh, the court reviewed only one of Judge Reinhardt's uh, decisions, uh, which it goes almost without saying the court reversed. Uh, indeed, I asked my research assistant to try to find for me the last Reinhardt opinion that had been affirmed by the Supreme Court, uh, but she said that she ran out of time before she was able to complete the assignment. Um, Judge Reinhardt, uh, whose colleague, Judge uh, Alex Kaczynski, has publicly called him, quote, a mastodon, close quote, and quote, an old, unreconstructed liberal who is practically extinct, close quote, uh, has not taken the Supreme Court's positions lying down. Uh, in fact, he's not taken Judge Kaczynski's remarks lying down uh, either. Judge Reinhardt has been quoted by the Seattle Times as saying that Judge Kaczynski's view of the Bill of Rights, quote, would make the Statue of Liberty weep. <laughs> After the Supreme Court had apparently stayed up all night uh, in one uh, important case, literally stayed up uh, all night, uh, solely in order to stop Judge Reinhardt in the Ninth Circuit from staying in execution so that they could hear the constitutional claims of a condemned prisoner, uh, Judge Reinhardt went to the Yale Law School and said this, the Supreme Court's proceedings in the Harris case were, quote, ugly, cruel, and injudicious, close quote. Uh, he further described the case as, quote, the logical culmination of a series of Supreme Court decisions subordinating individual liberties to the less than compelling interest of the state and stripping lower federal courts of the ability to protect individual rights. Similarly, in a case called Calderon uh, against Thompson, uh, the Supreme Court held that Judge Reinhardt and the Ninth Circuit had erred when they stopped an execution at the last minute in order to allow another condemned prisoner uh, to try to assert constitutional rights in a form uh, that could be heard by some court. Uh, writing for a 5-4 majority of the Supreme Court, uh, Justice uh, Kennedy, uh, representative of the current majority of the Supreme Court, uh, termed the Ninth Circuit's decisions uh, and actions in staying the execution is, quote, a grave abuse of judicial discretion, close quote. Uh, once again, Judge Reinhardt struck back, uh, this time in a lecture at the New York University Law School, uh, later published in the NYU Law Review. Uh, here is what Judge Reinhardt said on that occasion about the Supreme Court. Quote, the brutal attack by Justice Kennedy on the good faith and competence of his former colleagues on the Ninth Circuit may have revealed more about the justice himself than about anything else. The Supreme Court's decision tells us much about the lack of concern for justice and due process of law that permeate our death penalty jurisprudence uh, at this time. Uh, I hope that uh, I have not given the wrong impression in emphasizing Judge Reinhardt's willingness to engage in public controversy. Uh, as his record attests, he is not uh, solely or even principally uh, a lightning rod or a controversialist, uh, but a profoundly committed uh, but, but a judge with a profoundly committed liberal constitutional vision. When Judge Reinhardt speaks, as he was about to speak to us, about the Supreme Court and you, birth, death, and the quality of life, we can expect to hear words that are deeply thought out, uh, and we can also expect to hear the ruminations uh, of a very wise uh, jurist informed by his uh, experiences, but also uh, a jurist who feels himself deeply out of touch with the contemporary Supreme Court, uh, but also, again, at the same time, a jurist who believes that the Supreme Court's majority, current majority, uh, itself is profoundly out of touch with the deepest values of the American Constitution. The issues that Judge Reinhardt will address tonight are among the most challenging constitutional issues of our times, uh, and I can think of no one who is better equipped uh, and situated to address them uh, than Judge Reinhardt. So it is indeed, uh, for me, uh, a great uh, pleasure and even a privilege on this occasion to introduce to you Judge Stephen Reinhardt.
Thank you, uh, Professor Fallon. It's uh, really good to be here. Although I think Professor Fallon's really explained it all already. Uh, it's not, I don't have quite as distinguished a record as he said. I don't think I could get reversed seven times in a year all by myself. Uh, that must have been the panels, including the bank panels that I was on. Uh, that really would be quite an accomplishment. But I, I, it, it is true that I was affirmed once. And uh, you know, believe it or not, I think it's the only case in the history of the court where anyone was affirmed for lack of a quorum. Uh, but five out of the nine justices were disqualified because it was a case, it was a class action involving almost every corporation in America. And all these judges, had, uh, justices, had stock in the corporation, so they all had to recuse themselves. Fortunately, of course, I had no stock. So I wrote a wonderful opinion, and there was nothing they could do about it. So, uh, I don't think that's likely to happen again. Uh, anyway, it, it's, you know, I really don't enjoy having to discuss the Supreme Court particularly. I'd like to be here telling you what a wonderful system we now have and how everyone's rights are protected. And someday I hope I can come back and give you that speech. In the meantime, uh, let me talk about things as they are today. Uh, and so as I said to Professor Fallon uh, the other day when we were talking about all of this, you know, those of us who uh, get reversed with some frequency by the court uh, don't enjoy it particularly, uh, but we feel it's our obligation to apply the Constitution the way it's written and the way it has been applied. And if the Supreme Court decides they want to change the law, change the Constitution, uh, they have a right to do it. Uh, they, they're not exceeding their uh, legal authority when they change the Constitution to mean something that it hasn't meant up until now. But it's not the job of judges these days uh, who are not on the Supreme Court to try to anticipate those reductions in constitutional rights. So we uh, do our job and we apply the Constitution the way it's written and they do what they want to do to the Constitution. Uh, now to the speech. Uh, I believe that our Constitution, and particularly our Bill of Rights, is the greatest legal instrument ever devised. Nevertheless, as Justice Thurgood Marshall pointed out on its 200th anniversary, the Constitution was originally designed primarily to preserve the rights of property owners and white males. The protection of property rights and the status quo was also the objective of the federal judiciary for most of its history. When our nation grew and developed, not only in geographic size and in population, but in diversity of thought and background, it became clear that we had to amend our Constitution, and we did. In some instances, in response to the lessons of the Civil War, and in others, in response to a general increased awareness of the importance of individual rights and the need to make our institutions more democratic. For a long time, however, no parallel change occurred in the courts. Quite the contrary. The federal courts remained the instruments of conservatism, of preserving the status quo. Our Constitution was amended after about the first third of its existence to provide equal protection for all persons but particularly Negroes, as American, African Americans or blacks were then called. So looking at some recent court opinions, one would think it was to protect the oppressed white male. In any event, we ended slavery, made members of all races full citizens, and thereby made our Constitution a document that others throughout the world are now seeking to emulate. Following the adoption of the 14th Amendment, approximately another half century passed and we again changed our Constitution, this time to recognize for the first time the equality of women, at least in part. We did this by granting them belatedly the right to vote. As time went by, we corrected other important flaws in our constitutional system as well. 
We provided for the direct election of senators and authorized the income tax with its progressive approach to the sharing of responsibility, thus enabling the nation to achieve greater political and economic democracy. Throughout all these years, the federal courts remained elitist bastions of conservatism. The Supreme Court handed down the notorious post pro-slavery Dred Scott decision prior to the Civil War and followed it 40 years later with Plessy versus Ferguson, in which our Supreme Court endorsed separate but equal treatment of blacks, back of the bus, separate schools, bathrooms, water fountains, housing, and other facilities. In short, segregation. But even more basic to an understanding of the historic role of the federal courts is a knowledge of their profound economic and social conservatism. Their view that the role of the judiciary was to safeguard the economic interests of the upper class, protect the rights of property owners, implement the economic theories of Adam Smith, and thus preserve what we now call the free market system. The most benign justification for the manner in which federal courts function for the first 150 years of our nation's history is that federal judges saw it as their role to protect our traditional economic order against chaos and disruption and to ensure, ensure stability, predictability, and reliability in our economic system. Thereby, judges believed, courts could help guarantee an orderly society in which business could be conducted in a proper manner and citizens could live their lives secure in the understanding of how the system operates. Whether the rules were fair or not was of no significance as far as the courts were concerned. Fairness was someone else's problem. <laughs> Until the enactment of the Norris LaGuardia Act in 1932, federal judges regularly enjoined workers from engaging in any form of collective activity, including strikes, <laughs> boycotts, and picketing. Employees' rights were not only unheard of, but were considered conspiratorial, revolutionary, indeed un-American, by the federal judiciary. For the first 150 years, there was little, if any, protection afforded individual rights by our federal courts. The Fourth Amendment, the right to be free from arbitrary police action, to be secure in one's home against unlawful government intrusion, was unenforceable in the federal courts. It was the responsibility of the police to act properly and to police themselves. The First Amendment was recognized primarily in the dissents of Justices Oliver Wendell Holmes and Louis Brandeis, both rather conservative jurists, incidentally. Equal rights and civil rights remained almost unknown concepts. State and federal legislation benefiting workers was struck down as unconstitutional, as an infringement on the rights of employers. Minimum wage, child labor laws, wage and hour legislation were all considered to be violations of the due process rights of property owners. The federal courts were truly the enforcement arm of the wealthy of this nation and of the country's corporate interests. During the middle 1930s, all this began to change. The judicial revolution occurred first on the economic front. It was a product of the economic revolution that took place initially in the, in the executive and then the legislative branches of government. Franklin D. Roosevelt and the New Deal saved capitalism from itself, from its own selfish and unregulated excesses. Much as the upper class and the members of the self-defined aristocracy despised President Roosevelt as a traitor to his class and loathed his wife Eleanor even more, Franklin D. Roosevelt almost single-handedly stop this country from becoming a socialist nation. A master of both leadership and compromise, he instituted social welfare programs that provided a safety net for the poor. He created jobs for the unemployed, both in the public and the private sector. He instituted regulatory agencies that reigned in the unlimited greed of the corporate robber barons. And he instituted reforms that provided decent wages and conditions to working people. But the federal courts initially gutted the New Deal program. <coughs> Conservative federal judges used the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution to hold that the government was powerless to enact legislation that afforded economic rights or benefits to workers. They held that the New Deal economic legislation constituted a deprivation of property without due process of law. 
Shortly thereafter, the long-standing concept of a conservative federal, federal judiciary that constituted an insuperable barrier to social and economic progress came under formidable attack. President Roosevelt threatened to pack the court. In 1935, he proposed to expand the Supreme Court and add new blood to the nine old men who were frustrating his legislative programs by their judicial edicts. Although his proposal was soundly and properly condemned by almost everyone, it had its desired effect. The wall of conservative solidarity was breached. A majority of the Supreme Court changed its tune, and the court did not again invalidate an act of Congress for several generations. Thus, the role of the court as a guarantor of laissez-faire economics came to an end, at least until the era of Ronald Reagan and George Bush the first. <laughs> Disabused of the notion that their main role in life was to preserve the economic status quo, the federal courts spent the next two decades primarily doing no one any harm. They simply handled mundane problems affecting trade and commerce, a function they had performed well in the past. In essence, the federal courts became mainly a forum for the resolution of disputes between contending corporate interests. Venerated jurists devoted their full efforts to resolving admiralty cases, contract matters, business copyright and trademark disputes, and for occasional excitement, tort claims. The rare criminal cases involved offenses such as robberies of federal banks or transporting young ladies across state borders for purposes of engaging in, Im in immoral acts, namely sexual intercourse. Not until the 1950s did the true judicial revolution occur. Not until Earl Warren became Chief Justice of the United States and by force of his leadership persuaded the Supreme Court to adopt Brown versus Board of Education by a unanimous vote did the Supreme Court truly become the source for the recognition and advancement of individual rights for the protection of people and not just property. Today, we can't imagine that we would tolerate laws requiring blacks and whites to attend separate schools and to use separate facilities. That was only the beginning, however, for the Warren Court, or as it may more properly be called, the Warren Brennan Court. The new Supreme Court, led by two Republican appointees, even though President Eisenhower did say later that Warren and Brennan were the two greatest mistakes he ever made in office, Anyway, the, two, the new Supreme Court dramatically expanded judicial protection of individual rights. The court for the first time ordered that all persons on trial for crimes that carried serious prison sentences must be provided a lawyer if they could not afford to hire one. The court expanded the political rights of all voters with its historic one-man, one-vote decision. It struck down burdensome local restrictions on voting and made it possible for blacks to participate in the electoral process and to hold office in the South. It began to affect the lives of all of us in unprecedented ways. The Warren Court afforded us some of the basic individual liberties we now take for granted. In Connecticut and Massachusetts, for example, it was illegal to use or sell contraceptives or any other birth control devices. The rhythm method was favored by the powerful religious forces that dominated those states. Thanks to challenges to the Connecticut and Massachusetts statutes, the Warren Court held first that married Americans, then that unmarried Americans as well, had a privacy right in their marital and other intimate personal relations. In two historic decisions, the court told the government, as it did in numerous other cases thereafter, that it had no right to interfere in the personal lives of the people. These cases became the precursors of other previously unrecognized but fundamental personal liberties, including ultimately a woman's right of choice. The court established a wall of separation between church and state, which effectively precluded governmental support for religious institutions and coincidentally helped to change fundamental attitudes toward members of various religious groups. While previously Jews and members of other non-Christian religious minorities, and sometimes even Catholics, 
were viewed as second or third class citizens and treated as such, the philosophy underlying the wall of separation decisions played a part in causing Americans to rethink their religious biases. The Warren Brennan Court also breathed life into the moribund Fourth Amendment, and it turned the federal judiciary into the protector of people's rights against arbitrary governmental actions in area after area of the law. For the first time, the poor, the oppressed, the minorities, those without power, were given a place of sanctuary and hope, and their access to the federal courts was vastly increased. In the Warren Brennan era, the federal courts for the first time served the welfare of all the American people. The Warren Brennan era began to draw to a close in the 1980s. The reason was simple. Following President Lyndon Johnson's appointment of Thurgood Marshall to the court in 1967, there was a period of over 25 years during which all the appointments of Supreme Court justices were made by conservative Republican presidents, openly hostile to the enlightened and expansive jurisprudence of the Warren Brennan Court. The only Democratic president to hold office during that lengthy period, Jimmy Carter, had no vacancies to fill. While a few of the Republican appointees disappointed their sponsors by proving sympathetic to individual rights, the vast majority, led by the current Chief Justice, William Rehnquist, made no secret of their desire to curtail the role of the federal courts and the federal government to reduce dramatically, if not eliminate entirely, the gains made in the Warren Brennan era. Much of this was done in the guise of strict constructionism, or ultimately under the umbrella of a newly revived and newly captioned <coughs> concept of states' rights, this time called, perversely, federalism. The assault on the court from within went hand in hand with the political mood of the nation, which willingly adopted the anti-government, laissez-faire, <coughs> lower taxes messages of Ronald Reagan and George Bush and asked him patiently why the weak and the poor couldn't take care of themselves. The Rehnquist Court, using technical doctrines such as standing, rightness, and mootness, began by limiting access to the federal courts. It then drastically cut back on judicial <coughs> protection of civil rights to the point where, with rare exceptions, only whites could win victories in civil rights cases. The court eliminated many important Fourth Amendment protections in order to permit the government to wage more effectively the highly politicized, if highly unsuccessful, war on drugs. In this venture, it had the eager support of the Justice Department, whether under Republican or Democratic control. The court rendered use of the historic writ of habeas corpus extremely difficult, if not impossible, for persons convicted of crimes, particularly those facing capital punishment. And to the surprise of most Americans, it even raised serious questions as to whether the Constitution protects innocent persons against execution. The court expressed a fundamental unwillingness to recognize what it called new constitutional rights, seeking to retract rather than expand guarantees of individual liberty. Among the most disturbing of its decisions was Bowers versus Harvard which allowed states to prosecute consenting adults engaged in sexual activity in their own bedrooms. The case is widely viewed as doing the gay and lesbian rights what the Dred Scott decision in Plessy versus Ferguson did to the rights of blacks. The Reagan Bush minority on the Supreme Court has severely limited the power of fe lower federal courts to correct constitutional violations by state governments, and even more fundamentally, through its revisionist constructions of the 11th Amendment and the Commerce Clause, has thrown into doubt the long-established role of the federal government in enacting legislation to promote the general welfare. Finally, while at the very last minute, the court drew back from overruling Roe versus Wade on the ground that the rule was now well established, the threat that women's right to choice will be eliminated by the court remains stark indeed. One can only shudder to think how today's court would have decided Brown versus Board of Education, let alone Roe versus Wade. 
The only right about which today's court seems enthusiastic is once again the right to property. Life and liberty clearly take a back seat in the view of a good number of today's justices. The extreme views of those who favor the general judicial philosophy of the present court may be seen in a recent book by one who fortunately just missed becoming a justice himself, Robert Bork. <laughs> in his book, Slouching Court Gomorrah, Judge Bork says that Supreme Court decisions affording individuals the protection of the Constitution should be subject to an override vote by Congress. It would be difficult to find a view anywhere that shows less respect for our fundamental constitutional system or that more greatly threatens the traditional doctrines of separation of powers and judicial review. And that brings us to the Clinton era. President Reagan quite properly used his presidential power to appoint a large number of talented young conservatives who shared his view that the federal government was the enemy. Judges who believed that maximum power should reside in the states, that blacks were now a favored class, and that the authority of federal courts should be drastically limited in general. Presidents Reagan and Bush appointed 116 judges to the appellate courts, but Reagan did not appoint a single Democrat, and neither did Bush. Only three African Americans were appointed during that 12-year period, one being Clarence Thomas. The third appointment occurred, occurred shortly before the 1992 presidential election at the urging of Senator Specter, right after he read an article by Leon Higginbotham in the New York Times pointing out the almost total absence of African-American appointees by Presidents Bush and Reagan. By their nominations, those two presidents ensured a solid majority of conservative judges, both on the Supreme Court and on every one of the federal courts of appeal. These judges in the main applied the judicial philosophy in which the two Republican presidents, and they, believed. Their concept regarding the limited functions of the federal courts may be seen clearly in the whole range of cases that federal judges decide, civil and criminal, constitutional and statutory, administrative and common law, yes, even in the ordinary run of state law cases which reach the federal courts by way of diversity jurisdiction. These judges indeed sought to return the federal courts to the not so glorious role they played in the past despite the clear message of the Civil War amendments and the obvious need for a strong and effective national government in a modern America. President Clinton appeared to have a different philosophy regarding the role of government in the courts, or so many of those who voted for him thought. And it was expected that after a number of Clinton appointments, the federal courts would renew their interest in individual rights, that at the very least the doors to the courthouse would open wider. Much to everyone's surprise, President Clinton showed little interest in the judiciary. He expressed no desire to undo the Reagan-Bush revolution or to restore the Warren Brennan legacy. Although the two justices he appointed to the Supreme Court generally served as a moderate counterbalance to the conservative wing of the court. However, neither of them would describe themselves as proponents of the Warren Brennan constitutional philosophy. As a result, the golden era that marked our federal courts for a large part of the 20th century now appears, at least for the time being, to be at an end. Still, the Supreme Court is today at a unique juncture. It is currently composed of five conservatives and four moderate justices. The next president, if he serves two terms, or possibly even one, will likely have the opportunity to replace at least three members of the court. While there is presently no strong voice for fairness or procedural due process with respect to the rights of criminal defendants and little hope for a return to that approach in the foreseeable future, most other fundamental issues remain open. The first issue is that of federalism, or what may more accurately be called states' rights. The five conservative members of the court are presently engaged in a strong-willed effort to reverse the previously well-established consensus that the federal government has both the right and duty to promote the general welfare. While the four moderate justices 
has continued to resist vigorously. In the last 10 years, the court has been successful in making a hard turn to the right in this respect. Having obtained their critical fifth vote as a result of the replacement of Thurgood Marshall with Clarence Thomas in 1991, the conservative majority of the court has instituted a fundamental revision of the constitutional balance of power between the federal and state governments. Adding insult to injury, these five justices have orchestrated this shift by abandoning their, by, by abandoning their previous commitments to constitutional textualism and strict constructionism and assuming a new role of what can only be described as judicial activism. Before Justice Rehnquist joined the Supreme Court, the last congressional statute the court struck down was in 1936, amidst the controversy between President Roosevelt and the nine old men. Forty years later, as a harbinger of revolutionary though aggressive things to come, Justice Rehnquist, in an opinion written on behalf of the temporary five-member majority, held that the Fair Labor Standards Act, as applied to the states, exceeded Congress's Commerce Clause power. Justice Rehnquist wrote that Congress's attempt to set the same minimum wage and overtime conditions for state employees as for all other employees threatened to, quote, devour the essentials of state sovereignty. The court soon overturned Justice Rehnquist's opinion, and for the next 16 years, it ignored this extreme view of the allocation of powers between the state and federal government. <coughs> After all, we had fought a civil war over that very question, hadn't we? But then in 1991, Justice Thomas joined the court and gave the state's writers the five justice majority they now hold. One year later, the court resurrected the 10th Amendment from oblivion by employing it to hold provisions of the Radioactive Waste Policy Act unconstitutional. Then in 1995, in a five to four decision, the court struck down the Gun-Free School Zones Act. And in 1996, the same five <coughs> justices struck down the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. In 1997, the court dealt congressional authority to more bills, first by invalidating parts of the Brady Bill, and second by striking down the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. During its current term, the court has escalated its assault on the authority of the national government. In a series of five to four decisions, the conservative majority has invalidated parts of the Fair Labor Standards Act, the Trademark Act, the Patent Infringement Act, and most recently, parts of the Age Discrimination and Employment Act. To finish out the term, the court has agreed to decide in three more cases whether in the name of federalism it will abolish all or part of the Violence Against Women Act, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and the legislation that authorizes citizen suits to stop fraud against the government. The court's revival of states' rights affects us all in sometimes subtle but almost always profound ways. It affects whether the federal government can achieve effective gun control, combat religious intolerance, control the treatment of radioactive waste, prevent violence against women, and allow the disabled and the elderly to obtain remedies for state-sponsored discrimination. The court's invocation of the federalism doctrine threatens a range of other concerns. <coughs> Our national government's involvement in helping establish standards for public education <coughs> may be called into question, as well as its ability to make states accountable for harming the environment. What remains of the New Deal welfare programs, insofar as they require actions by state governments, may also become victims of the court's federalism crusade. The justices, however, are so closely divided on the federalism issue that the next administration's appointment will probably determine which side will ultimately prevail in this crucial battle. A number of other issues also hang in the balance. For example, it is easily imaginable that Roe versus Wade could be overturned in the next four to eight years if two or more additional conservative justices are appointed. Several of the present justices have explicitly stated their desire to do so. And the two leading candidates for the Republican presidential nomination have both pronounced Roe versus Wade to be wrong. As for gay rights, the court has thus far issued 
two major decisions. One protecting gays from discrimination and the other doing the opposite. The next cases the court hears may determine which side prevails here as well. Ultimately, the court will decide whether the Constitution's guarantee of equal treatment applies to gays and lesbians in at least the same manner as it does to women. In the area of physician-assisted suicide, the court has basically deferred the complex questions involved until a later date. But someday the court will be forced to address the question again, this time squarely. Another health issue, of course, is the use of medically prescribed marijuana for patients who are unable to sustain any other form of medication. As for racial issues, although a majority of the present justices oppose affirmative action, the court has yet to close the door completely to such programs. In recent years, the court has twice attempted to take the case concerning significant affirmative action issues in the area of education. But on both occasions, last minute procedural changes precluded the court from hearing the cases. Within the next few years, all these issues, federalism, abortion, gay rights, physician-assisted suicide, medical marijuana, affirmative action, and many others will likely be resolved. The question is, by whom? On these and a number of other fronts, the court's constitutional decisions deal with our lives from birth to death and in between. The court's abortion cases tell women whether and under what circumstances they must give birth. And its physician-assisted suicide cases tell all of us, at the end of our lives, what we may or may not do about easing the process of dying. There are religion cases that affect individuals' relationship to their God, that determine whether we are free to worship according to our own beliefs or not, and whether the government can be involved in sponsoring religious practices in public settings in which we, particularly young people, may be compelled to be unwilling participants. The court's forthcoming decision this term on grandparents and other third-party visitation rights is an example of its ability to determine questions as to who among us may participate in the rearing of children with whom we have close identification, and indeed to decide the very contours of our family relationships. Its gay right cases concern the intimate details of our sexual lives, and its Fourth Amendment cases decide when the government can stop us in our automobiles, search through our garbage, test our children for drugs, and examine the contents of our files and computers. Its decisions concerning the kind of aid the government can give to private and parochial schools may decide whether the public school system, as we know it, will survive. Finally, its environmental decisions may have the greatest impact of all. Those cases directly affect not only the world we live in, but the world that we leave for our children and for their children as well. In all these matters, the current makeup of the Supreme Court lacks any representation of the Warren Brennan view of the Constitution. Although Justice Stevens, a Ford appointee, comes close in some respects, and Justice Souter appears to be moving in that direction to some degree. Whereas the Warren Court viewed it as its duty to resolve cases with a full appreciation of the broad promises contained in the Constitution for the protection of individual rights and for the role of government in helping people to meet their full potential, the present court has little sympathy for that approach. In fact, even the two Clinton appointees are reluctant to recognize any fundamental right or liberty interest that has not been recognized previously by some other justices. This, anti this antagonism to substantive due process is most disturbing given how long it takes for the philosophical composition of the court to change. Justices are replaced one at a time as they become incapacitated, die, or elect to leave office voluntarily. Some try to time their retirement so that their replacement will be appointed by a president who shares their philosophical views. It is most unlikely that any president will ever again have the opportunity to appoint a majority of the court. In fact, it is unusual that the next president may have the chance to replace up to three or four justices. 
Given the customary slow turnover and the fact that many cases are currently being resolved by the same five to four split, the identity of the next appointees will probably determine much about how Americans will live their lives for generations to come. So where does all that leave us? Well, at the very least, it leaves us in doubt that the Supreme Court is the least dangerous branch. Beyond that, it suggests that we are at a place in history in which a bare majority of the court would like to return the institution to the role it played after the Civil War, a conservative power bastion that resists the full implementation of the rights and liberties guaranteed by the Bill of Rights and the 14th Amendment. That bare majority would also like to return the court to the role it played at the start of the New Deal. It would once again make the court a counter-majoritarian institution that unhesitatingly strikes down federal legislation that promotes the general welfare. But as I have said, we are at a critical juncture. We still have a choice. We can continue on the present course, and thus re-enter what more closely resembles the 19th than the 21st century, or we can change directions and move toward a fairer and more just judicial system, a system that fully respects the freedom and equality of individuals and the historic role of the federal government in safeguarding the rights and liberties of all Americans. The decision is yours. Thank you. On behalf of all of us, I would first uh, thank uh, Judge Reinhardt, and then I believe on behalf of Judge Reinhardt, I advise you that Judge Reinhardt is very to make himself available for questions for the next few minutes if anybody has uh, a question for Judge Reinhardt. And while we're warming up a little bit, I'll seize the opportunity of the floor to put uh, a question of my own. Um, one of the things that was very striking to me uh, in your very interesting remarks, interesting on so many uh, dimensions, is the suggestion that when Presidents Reagan and Bush had the opportunity, they of course very appropriately seized that opportunity to try to appoint conservative activists to the Supreme Court. That conservative Republicans, that's of course what they were trying to do, is fill up the court with conservative uh, activists. And now in many ways, uh, your uh, remarks seem like a plea for the election of a Democratic president who would similarly try to fill up the Supreme Court with liberal action. And my question, I guess, is whether that kind of sort of political tit for tat uh, about the Supreme Court uh, holds any kind of possibility for the kind of legal equilibrium and the partial separation of law from politics. And I put it in with carefully, partial separation. I don't think any intelligent, informed person believes that there's any possibility of a total separation of law from politics, but something more like a partial separation uh, of law from politics. Uh, in the long run, might not a little bit of restraint with respect both to appointments and judicial practice, whether from the left or from the right, point us in the direction of uh, a more stable and attractive legal equilibrium and an overall healthier political system uh, than a more unrestrained uh, political attitude toward the staffing of the judicial branch of government. Well, I, I would say yes. Once we get back to the Warren Brennan philosophy, <laughs> <laughs> then we ought to be a little more restrained. <laughs> Uh, you know, I don't think there's much danger of what you say. We've had that restraint for the last eight years. Uh, that's part of the problem. There hasn't been an effort to redress 25 years of moving just directly to the right without any, uh, you know, any, without a single Democratic appointee. Not that that like, is enough. Uh, the, when I say Democratic, I'm talking about the philosophy. And, and the nominees don't always follow what the presidents think they will do. But that's less and less a problem. And <coughs> Senator Rudman managed to snooker John Saluno, and they ended up with uh, Justice Souter, 
but that was just a mistake. Uh, Ronald Reagan, after he was governor of California, said he would never make a mistake he made again. And I, you know, I think that there's not much doubt that for that 25-year period, you had a deliberate effort to move the court away from a view of the Constitution that I think is appropriate. I think it's time to get back there. I'd be happy with a Republican president who believes in those things. I'm not sure it matters a lot. Well, it doesn't matter a lot. But I'm not here to advocate. I don't know. None of my candidates is likely to get elected. Um, but, so I'm, I'm not here to advocate a particular one, but it will make some difference. Uh, I mean, probably if you get one of the parties, you'll get this what you want. So this wonderful sort of balance that's not move too much, let's not, uh, you know, I can't see anybody who's going to do what, what Reagan and Bush did. And I said, you know, I never criticized that they believed that what the court was doing was wrong. They wanted a different kind of society. They never hit it. They, uh, you know, they announced it was one of the issues. They said they wanted to change the court, and they did. So, would it be better if they hadn't? Yes. Uh, it would have been better if they hadn't. Uh, what do you do to stop uh, the extremes from, you know, going, taking the court first to the right, then to the left. Well, it's not a practical problem. The danger is, after eight years of Clinton, is that you have a whole philosophy that is bad to have any principles, or any commitments, or any value. If you've done anything any good, uh, that's a disqualifying trait. I mean, we elected a Democrat as governor of California, to, uh, I'm sorry to say, uh, after years of Republicans. And today, yesterday, he held a press conference in Washington and said, any judge I appoint has to believe the death penalty is good, has to favor abortion, has to accept my view of the criminal justice And any judge who says that, and I appoint him, and if he changes his mind when he's on the bench, then he has an obligation to resign because he no longer will be enforcing my philosophy. Well, and I, that's what it's like uh, these days. Uh, it's very difficult for a public defender to get appointed. It's very difficult for anyone who's worked for a public interest group to get appointed. Now, it's, um, the, there is a problem, I mean, clearly, with what's going on in the Senate now and judicial confirmations is not helping. But I'm afraid the greatest danger is that either uh, there'll be several other justices who will go along with what's going on now, or you'll have people appointed who really don't have a particular philosophy at all, and who think that the ideal thing in life is to be from the middle of the road. Is that what some virtue. Uh, that's the way uh, we look at presidential candidates these days. Who's in the middle of the road? Not who really wants to do something, but who has ideas. And given the choice of the two dangers, I think the greatest one is lack of, of philosophy, lack of vision, lack of commitment, and lack of belief in the Constitution. But I, I recognize the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Um, across the range of issues that you have outlined, that the present, I guess, majority is taking kind of right. I'm kind of curious your view of how that jurisprudence impacts the opinion that the public at large might hold of the court, and how that view that the public holds of the court might translate into legislative holding. A and B. Suppose that we did. Uh, get a new administration and appointed uh, justices who had a philosophy antithetical to philosophy of the church. Um, and then those new justices went about kind of reversing kind of this right turn to left turn. How much damage would that do um, due to kind of the image that the public might have as the court as a kind of a political body? Well, you know, the first place is, I'm taking second question first, it's just not going to happen. Uh, even if uh, there is a Democrat election and he gets three appointments, you're not going to have a liberal majority by any means, even if he appointed three liberals, which is inconceivable, uh, since we're not talking about electing a liberal president, we're talking about electing a 
moderate, middle of the road, plotting Democrats. Uh, not just not electing somebody from the left wing of the Democratic Party. So if he appoints three more justices like his boss, Mr. Clinton, appointed, you're going to have five moderate justices uh, who will be a majority instead of five very conservative. So the five moderates will not do any more damage for a while, and but they're not going to, certainly they're not, as I said about the two, they're not, they, they wouldn't describe themselves as believers in the uh, in the Warren Brennan philosophy. They don't believe in substantive due process. They, they're proceduralists. They like charts and guidelines. And, you know, but there's no, uh, they, there's not a, you don't have to worry about that problem. <laughs> the court's going to go to the left too far. Uh, the first problem is to, how does it reflect the public view? So I think you have to separate two things. One of the problems is criminal law which is, I said, the one area that's just gone. I mean, there's, there's no interest anywhere in preserving the Fourth Amendment or the rights of defendants, except when a conservative gets arrested. That's when you get some interest in, in procedural rights. But generally, there is none in the courts. Uh, there are no justices who really care about cr criminal defendants or their rights. And that probably matches up pretty well with the public view. It's always been popular issue for politicians, people running for office, to say, I'll double the sentences. And then the next guy's got to double what he said. And uh, that's very popular with the public. I don't know when that will ever stop. Uh, you know, it's, uh, the, it's a separate problem about you know, the prisons filling up, who they're filling up with, why, the length of the sentences, uh, the arbitrariness of these sentences. But there's, as, as, a, as a political issue, there isn't a candidate in the country who wants to say any of that. So one of the problems is that the views of the country are affected by leaders. And if you have leaders who make people stretch and think and have uh, do have to take interest in, in, in people other than themselves, that's good. But we don't have any political leaders these days who are going to go out and talk about how unfair our criminal justice system is. As far as the rest of it, I mean, that is part of the system, that the, uh, you know, that, that the appointment of judges reflects, to some extent, the political view of the country. It's just been an aberration, in a way, that we've had, uh, this, had this whole 25-year period where not that the one party dominated the country that way, but it dominated the judicial appointment. But I, I think that the, you know, the view of the, of the country, I don't think that the, the country has a view on federalism. Uh, I think on the other issues, I don't think the country is as conservative as the court, uh, other than the criminal justice issue. But, you know, the court's never really been an issue in election campaigns, although so many of the politicians are afraid of from the denomination, the thinkable effect. Of. But generally, that the country hasn't paid that much attention uh, to the court or its composition. Yeah. Um, okay, this is kind of a long winded question, but you mentioned several times your devotion to upholding the Constitution, and you mentioned the Roe v. Wade case and the debate over that. Um, for those people that do believe, uh, that abortion is wrong, that it's murder, or whatever else. Uh, it seems to me that there's a good argument that that is legitimately a debate rather than a constitutional issue. Something about, you know, the trimesters and stuff, not really flowing from what the Constitution says. And so my question, and again, you've touched on this with some of the political stuff, but why are questions like that not better left to Congress or uh, the, the legislature rather than the court? And why does the court want to be at the center of those political issues because in my mind if they don't directly flow from the constitution you run the risk of getting a majority of conservative justices that can turn around and go exactly the way you don't want to go later well it's not much of a risk because if you say do it otherwise or else they'll do it i mean you know worse off if they do it than otherwise but you know it's not you see these issues if you said these are issues that government shouldn't be involved in, uh, these are personal issues, I think I could 
you know, understand that and maybe agree with you. But it's not just a question of which branch of government is going to make these decisions. Is the legislature or the, is the state going to tell women that they are not allowed to have abortion? And people who feel strongly about not having not having abortions shouldn't have them. Uh, but do they have a right? Does the state have a right to tell other people? Well, you know, there's no single view of the Constitution that's absolutely correct. I can't say my view is correct or Justice Rehnquist's view is incorrect. Uh, we all have different understandings of the Constitution. To me, the Constitution is basically to pr protect individuals, to be themselves, to live their lives free of, of the state dictating to them what they can do. And to me, that's what makes abortion the type of issue where the court should protect a minority even against the majority. Uh, it's the state including on your freedom to do what you want. Now, obviously other people have different views. And, yeah. But, but I guess I would say precisely for that reason, then, yeah. why are you so worried about the federalism cases? Because your stated reason was that, well, if that happens, then Congress won't have the power to legislate and tell people what to do to fix the problems that they see. So are those not inconsistent? No, because they can fix the problems as long as they don't violate the Constitution. Uh, they can pass bills to help people who need assistance. They can not pass bills to take away people's rights. But federalism isn't designed to protect people against, uh, against government. It's designed to let the states intrude into your life instead of the federal government. And on, on that issue, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's not really a libertarian issue. It's not a, a, a right of the, the people issue. It's a right of one branch of government as opposed to another branch of government. It seems that an interesting element of the, the resistance of the moderate minority to the revolution that's going on is that they seem to preface the sense in different nuances of the <coughs> cases that come down by restating their reluctance and their re refusal to embrace seminal tribe. So from where you're sitting, I was wondering if you could comment on at what point you think it's appropriate, like when should a judge stop dissenting or stop restating, you know, when does stare decisis kick in or something like that? And then from your position at the circuit court where you don't have the luxury of dissenting to a Supreme Court opinion, how do you grapple with you know, let's say federalism cases or another body of cases that you perceive as just so fundamentally wrong and misguided? Well, on the first question, I think that's a good question. Uh, you know, Justice Rehnquist, uh, when his the decision I was talking about earlier got overturned in the FSC, uh, said practically came out and said, we're going to get a fifth vote. And as soon as we have the power, we're going to take it back and do it the other way. Uh, I don't know, that's not exactly considered cricket, but it's, it was a realistic statement of the way life works. He now is very upset that the other four uh, don't just say, okay, we've lost, and they keep restating it. Uh, I suppose that, you know, that there's, I don't, there's no, I, no rule, there's no way to, to know that. It says after a while, when you've really lost, it gets unseemly. Uh, I guess they don't feel they've really lost. Uh, they may be a bit optimistic. I think uh, after the next election, if, they, if uh, there's a Republican president who appoints more judges who believe the way the five do about federalism, I think they'll stop protesting. Uh, it's you know, the first time I can remember, other than you know, uh, Marshall and uh, Brennan saying if they had a right to do it, each death penalty case, we believe it's wrong. Uh, this is the only area in which I can think of the court minority saying over and over again, as you say, we disagree with what they're doing. I suppose they can rationalize it by saying each one is another step. But they really are just waging a uh, you know, strong opposition, and, and I think they feel it's not resolved. Uh, but the, uh, the, my problem is not as difficult as you say. Uh, or my think, what do you do when you disagree with the, what the Supreme Court's done and you've got to apply the law? Well, that happens a lot of the time. I mean, it's not an isolated uh, or occasional occurrence. I mean, most judges who have to apply the sentencing guidelines feel that way. Uh, it's a horrendous system. And most judges who have to send 
young kids away for 30 or 40 years because they're at the bottom of the drug you know, distri distributing rank. Uh, it, it really, uh, you know, it upsets a lot of them tremendously. But they do it. Uh, you know, there's not much choice. You can't expect, you know, just to, as a client, I mean, as a lawyer represents clients and doesn't agree with them all the time, a judge has to apply uh, the law as others see it. And uh, that's just part of the job. But, you know, if you get to the point, I suppose, you know, there, there, there might, it's not really that difficult for a court of appeal to because you, know, you could, if you found it so unpalatable, you could just not participate in that case. Uh, you could recuse yourself. You don't have to give an explanation. Uh, or you can do it and write a concurrence and say, I disbelieve, and I strongly think this is incorrect, but I am compelled to do it. Uh, it it's not that hard unless it's something that you just, if it becomes a matter of religious principle, for instance, if you were a Catholic who really followed the philosophy of the church, uh, unlike a number of the judges around, uh, but if you really believed in the philosophy of the church, then you could not vote to oppose a capital punishment case. It's a matter of religious conviction. And then I think you would have to step aside from that case if you couldn't follow the law. But there don't seem to be too many people bothered by those great moral principles. Yeah. I was wondering what you thought. I know in the last decade the legislature has passed a number of laws encouraging private dispute resolution, and um, especially the 1998 ADR Act, which has been setting up the ADR program. I just wondered what you thought about uh, that moment. Well, uh, actually, uh, as far as the general is going on in the federal courts, I'm really not really familiar with it, and I have no opposition to voluntary. ADR programs. I do have opposition. Several judges are not going to something supposed to be voluntary. You know, aren't very good at really making things voluntary. They put a lot of pressure on people. I, I don't think people should be forced in non-judicial uh, areas. I, I believe strongly in the courts and the system and the right of people to come to court and not be shunted off to somebody else. I think it, it's, it's wonderful to have the system available for the people who want to use it. Now, we have in our state courts what they call renegades, and it's a horrendous system. It's, it, it leads to two classes of justice. Uh, people who can afford to go out and buy the judges, uh, and they get a certain type of decision and quickness and efficiency. It, it ties right in. It's not a private system. You, you go through the courts afterwards the way you do in arbitration. But they also make discovery procedures available. But the point of it is that it, it establishes the courts for the poor people and the ready judges for the other. So the worst part about it is, is that all our state court judges are just waiting until they become ready judges. And even our Supreme Court justices have resigned in order to become ready judges and make a lot of money. Now, in, in addition to the fact that that's unseemly, uh, but that, I hope that won't happen with future governors. We had governors who couldn't use the best judgment in their appointments. But, uh, but what's really bad about it is that these judges know that in four, five, three years, they're going to be out in the private market looking for clients. And they're trying to build a reputation as judges uh, to establish good relations with the lawyers they think will be picking them, uh, make the kind of decisions that they can sell. The day they reach retirement age, there are big pictures of them with ads. You know, look, we got Judge X. Uh, what a wonderful, what decisions he's made. What a fine range judge he's going to do. I mean, it's just atrocious. <laughs> and uh, I, that hasn't happened in several days yet. We've lost one or two. Who knows they lost probably. <laughs> <laughs> the system has almost every single state judge in California who reaches retirement age goes into this rather judge racket. And uh, that I think is very unfortunate. Okay, thank you.